Well, what I thought we would talk about today is that nobody w- wants to fight for their country anymore. And this is interesting because in some ways it's you know, self-evidently bad. And in some ways I think it's also good. And I think we're going to break down uh, how and why in a sort of discussion. And I'm going to go through just what's been reported recently. And my main reason for talking about this today, because this has been in the news for the past couple of months, and I'm going to talk about some of the coverage on it. But the main reason I wanted to look at it is this, because I think this article cuts at why lots of countries, certainly in the West, are struggling to get the numbers that they want, is that there has been a sharp decline in white recruits that hasn't been reflected in other demographics, which I find interesting. And I'm just going to read a little bit about this from the article, not too much. Um, just to fill in some of the details, and then we can sort of discuss what we think about it. So the army's recruiting of white soldiers has dropped significantly in the last half decade, according to internet data reviewed by military.com. What's happened in the past half decade, I wonder, the past five years? Um, A decline that accounts for much of the service's historic recruitment slump has become the subject of increasing concern for army leadership in, um, in Capitol Hill. This is, of course, in the United States. The shift in demographics for incoming recruits would be irrelevant to war planners, except it coincides with an overall shortfall of about 10,000 recruits for the army in 2023. So it's interesting that when there's a sharp decline of white recruits, there is a massive shortfall in people joining the military. It kind of indicates that white recruits were disproportionately overrepresented in the military, which I think anyone with any anecdotal experience with the military or has been in the military would probably be able to vindicate, right? Well, there were more British Muslims joining ISIS than the British Army. Yeah, that's not surprising, is it? No. Hi, folks. We've rolled out a new feature on the website, which is the ability to pay for an individual piece of content. So usually it's £5 a month every month to subscribe to all of the content on the website. But I appreciate there are going to be people who simply don't want to do that. They, They would be interested instead in purchasing a single piece of content for a lower amount and they've got a particular a particular niche that they're interested in watching. And so they don't want every single piece of content. They just want this one thing. So we've introduced this function where you can just simply purchase the one thing for £1.89, which I think is about $2.30 at the current exchange rates. Uh, and then that's just yours forever. So there's no sort of commitment there. There's no uh, rolling subscription. It's just that one thing. So that's an option now that's on the website. It's completely live. It's completely available. And uh, please go and enjoy it. And we'll see you all very soon. Uh, there's a few reasons for this, I think. And I don't want to, to derail I know, reading anymore. First, obviously, is that the military are implementing diversity, equity, and inclusion policies. So mm-hmm. they are having preferential hiring schemes, as we saw with the RAF saying they don't want any more useless white male pilots in Britain. So that means that they're actively discriminating against the exact kind of white men that would have beforehand come to defend their country. But also, it's not just the racial demographic. It's because as white Anglo countries, the US, UK, Australia, etc., we're going to have a higher proportion of white men in there because that's our ethnic composition. But even in Japan, they have fallen short of their troop recruitments by about half for the last Mm -hmm. few years. And so it seems to be speaking to a kind of disbelief in the nation state and a disaggregated sense of lost responsibility within developed populations. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, I think that there's certainly a certain amount of reaction against the discrimination that white people face in their their own nations in that well, I wouldn't want to fight for my country if I was treated like a second-class citizen, if there are legal barriers to me succeeding that aren't put up against other people. Well, then why would I serve that country if they're deliberately trying to um, discriminate against you? And also, you know, you hear about how evil white men are. Well, why should we go out and fight and die um, for our country then, if, if that's how we're treated at home? I saw, I can't remember if it was Morgoth or maybe Millennial Woes, someone on Twitter put it really well. They said, you know, if you've seen your country get hijacked by people that haven't got your best interests at heart and turn your country into sort of a retail park without any history and heritage and that sort of thing, why would you fight and die and make the ultimate sacrifice Mm. on behalf of that? We were never It's a fair point. It's a a fair point. Um, And also the idea that first or even second or third generation immigrants would join the British Army. I mean, of course they're not inclined to do that. Mm. I once saw a year or two ago, just a Vox Populi on the street type thing, asking people of colour if they would ever consider joining the British Army. And their responses, as you can imagine, are like, (laughs) of 
course not. Like, what a stupid mm. question. Well, of course not. Um, for them as well, what instills you a sense of discipline and strength and reverence for your nation and gratitude is having a dad in your household. And disproportionately, those demographics do not have a present father. So it's not shocking that they would rather engage in street violence than hone their craft and go and defend their country, either overseas or, God forbid, we ever be invaded. It is also worth mentioning as well that some of the most patriotic people who are very sort of, at least I've, I spoke to the people in Britain, that are sort of king and country, you know, you know where their loyalties lie and it's here. They're normally in the military. And so when people are doing things that are anti-British and trying to demonize Britain, well, if you hold those views, you're far less inclined to think, well, I want to serve this because you, are, you see yourself as a true patriot, if you will. And so as this sort of outgroup of the current regime, you don't want to strengthen them. And I think that that's a perfectly reasonable reaction, although I would, I've kind of thought about this myself and put myself in the shoes of someone who might join. And my sort of distinction is, if it's going to be another foreign war, you can get stuffed. But if, if you know, there were troops looking to invade the British Isles, sort of similar to a World War II situation where it's fighting for the survival of my country, well, even though it's a regime I don't like, you know, everyone I've ever known and, and loved and everything I hold dear is on the, these islands. So I, I would consider myself a coward not to fight and defend that at the same time, even though I wouldn't like the government I was fighting on behalf of. But that's the thing. If we were to be invaded, we would actually defend our homes, whether or not we were in the military. But if you mm -hmm. join the military, the chances that you're going to be a conscript for the UN's global security police spreading bumming to the Middle East or acting as some kind of <laughs> private security contractor. It's already catching on. Well, um, yeah, acting as some kind of enforcer for like Biden Incorporated, knocking over buildings in Afghanistan so his brother can go and seize up the development contracts there. Why would I want to fight for that? Mm. I'm not in conscripted in some sort of moral crusade for, for the UN or uh, the military industrial complex. No thanks. Like you discredited yourself on the world stage from Iraq, Afghanistan, the Vietnam War, etc. Why would I bother? Yeah, another small piece of perhaps anecdotal evidence is you, we've had Charlie Downs on, haven't we? Yes. Yeah. I really like the guy. Um, and he talked to me about how he's considering joining mm -hmm. the, uh, the army or wants to be in the infantry. Um, you know, that type of person like Charlie, is, uh, they're quite rare these days. Sort of yeah, well, super based. He wants to go know, in so, for this sort of personal virtue building, doesn't he? Mm. I think that's the impression I got. And yeah, he's, he's a lovely guy, isn't he? Yeah, and, but the point is, I think young men like him are a dying breed. Mm. Right, regardless of whether you become a foot soldier on behalf of the Bi Biden Inc., just uh, don't even care about that. It would just be a personal point of prestige to be in the British Army. Um, I don't know very many young men that are like that, think like that. I, I, I don't, I don't want to discredit Charlie's motivation for doing so because he's a lovely bloke. But he has also said that part of the reason as well is it allows him to have some form of credibility before running for public office. So it's... Of course, I'd much rather our politicians have some kind of public service role, which would mean he'd much more qualified than like David Lammy or some jumped up academic. But that's also another thing that's happened, particularly with the American military. And it's that rather than be in the armed forces as some kind of uh, accreditation mechanism to then go and serve your country in another way, one of the benefits that's tied to the armed forces is we'll pay for your college. Well, also college admissions for white men are not just disadvantaged because of DEI, but also the learning environment's not conducive to the way men like to learn. It's incredibly hostile social environment. So if they're trying to use that as a selling point to get white men to go into the military as well, they're going, well, I don't want to go to college either because you just hate me there too. Mm -hmm. I think we, we do need military people in politics, don't we? Because you, you want a defense secretary that has a military mind. And so that is a clear advantage. We don't have one now with Grant Shapps. That'd be nice. No, yeah, we did have, um, you know, Johnny Mercer was involved, although, you know, questionable politics, but I know he's, uh, you know, from Plymouth and I know secondhand stuff that he's very much on side of the military being treated well and things like that. And he has done good work. So it, it does make sense to have people with that background, I think. Charlie Downs just went up a tiny bit more in my estimation. That's deliciously old school. Hmm. I need to have been in the services to be taken seriously yeah. in, in public office. That is really old school, you know, like in the post-war, post-World War II period, anyone that didn't serve during the war, there's sort of a question mark over you. <laughs> um, nobody really thinks, like you're not really forced to think in those terms anymore, are you? Mm. And yet 
there is a there is sort of a, a value to that. It, you know, it does make some sense. I suppose it lends itself well to this transition, at least in some European countries, of us largely focusing on having a sort of elite crack force. And those are the kind of people that are going to be in those kinds of forces, the people who are very internally motivated, determined, and have a good set of values behind them. This is also something, we're in a bit of a technological transitional stage of where on the ground infantry for mass foot soldier fighting style warfare is on the way out as other nations and us outsource that kind of thing to drone warfare of where instead you'll need sort of specialist wet work units like the SAS or the Marines to, to have that human element. So you have strategic strike force teams rather than just loads of lads with guns. Mm -hmm. um, so that's also why, I mean, troop numbers going down overall are to be expected, but it's the composition of the troops that's the worrying thing. Because if you're just packing it full of diverse lesbians who care more about... Well, they're not joining, so... Well, yeah, it's not they're really still marketing to them. Yeah, they are. I do you think, and I may be proven wrong in the decades to follow, but I, I do think that having dozens or even hundreds of infantry divisions is a thing of the past, probably. Uh, yeah, special forces um, and, and air forces and drone warfare uh, is almost certainly the future of the needed, you know, 100 divisions to invade Iran mm. or or kick the Ruskies out of Central Europe or something. I, I don't think that's unlikely. I, I might be proven wrong, but I think that's unlikely to happen. I think the logistics of it add up more in that direction, don't they? Mm. I think the dynamics changed post-World War II to a certain extent as well. The invention of the nuclear bomb, I think, has also given people a certain amount of security. You don't need a massive standing army anymore because people know you've got a nuclear deterrent. That's the I think that that's... Like cucked all men. Well, yeah. I, fewer I, men I, can I, engage in warfare because of nuclear arms. I, I do have that sort of inclination that I've missed something out, especially if I watch like the Lord of the Rings and you watch the charge of the Rohirrim. I'm just like, oh, I want to die in battle. Why? I've been robbed. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go to Valhalla. The Vikings used to think that there was something very shameful about growing old and I, not getting yourself killed gloriously in battle. Being I a grey that... beard is... is Shameful. I have that sort of instinct. I've not I don't want to think like this, but I kind of feel like I've missed the boat a bit. I should have died in war, damn it. <laughs> but anyway, I'm going to carry on reading some of the details of this. Um, apparently, the shift in demographics for incoming recruits would be irrelevant to war planners, except, oh, yeah, I've already read that bit. Um, shortfall of about 10,000 recruits for the army in 2023, and it missed its target of 65,000 new soldiers. Um, so a total of 44,000 new army recruits were categorized by the service as white in 2018, but that number has fallen consistently each year to a low of 25,000. So that is massive um, for a fall in the space of a few years. Really, it's about 40% it? drop, isn't it? Yeah, in five years. So that's astronomical. That's a catastrophe for the military that they've lost that number of people. Are we still talking about America here? Yes, we are. Similar things are happening in, in the UK. Yes, and I'm going to be getting on to those, yeah. I think that, um, again, you may well get on to this, but they're, the tactics they're using with advertising, both in America and Britain, I mean, if I had been inclined to join, I was younger and I saw the adverts. I'm going to be mentioning those, it, don't worry. It would, just, it would be enough to sort of pour cold water on your enthusiasm, wouldn't it? Well, yeah, because it makes the military look lame. And one of the selling points is that it's masculine. You know, it's being able to, being capable of violence is the cornerstone of masculinity, isn't it? Of course, having the self-control to know when it's appropriate is also a very important part of it. But that's what the military is all about fundamentally. That's why it appeals psychologically to people. That's why I've got that, that craving for, for death in battle, even though, you know, I'm a, a sort of house cat of a podcast host, right? <laughs> Working in an office. <laughs> yeah, but the last thing you want to do in a firefight as well is have some Karen in your ear going, you know, we're, we're held down. And she goes, I don't know, what do you want to do? You know, that, 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 that vision is put forward by the, I grew up in California with two mums advert. It doesn't, doesn't inspire you to go off and die for your country, does it? Yeah. So I'm just going to read a little bit about some of the details. So um, during 2018, 56.4% of new recruits were categorized as white. In 2023, that number had fallen to 44%. 
During that same five-year period, black recruits have gone up from 20% to 24% of the pool, and Hispanic recruits have risen from 17% to 24%, with both groups seemingly um, seeing large flat recruiting totals, but increasing as a percentage of incoming soldiers as white recruiting has fallen. So even with DEI programs and relentless advertising about hating white men, they haven't recruited any more blacks and Hispanics. It's just that their proportion of the force has gone up because recruits overall have fallen. Yes. Also, right. thanks for scrolling down the article while I was reading it. I That's okay. That. Um, so now on to the most annoying headline I think I've ever seen. Um, I think you might have actually heard me whinging about this yesterday afternoon. I don't know. You do that a lot. I, I like a good whinge. That's true. That's why, that's why I've not joined the military. They don't like that, apparently. Um, the US Army is falling short of its recruitment goals. She has a plan for that. Um, she. Who's she? The cat's mother? That's why I was asking about that yesterday. Um, but yes, they, who, what are you on about? What a silly headline. And, well, it's the Secretary and it's so, of the Army yeah. is a woman. I know, but also they're, they're doing it like, well, she has a, prob- uh, a solution for that. She has a plan. It's like so smarmy and annoying. NPR, by the way, um, if you're listening. So the American public are funding that. Yes. And uh, I'm going to read a tiny bit from it. The Secretary of the Army, Christine uh, Wormuth, uh, is rolling out a plan to address the recruitment problems. Uh, the army is bringing back its iconic ad with the slogan, Be All You Can Be, which was everywhere in the 80s, hoping to inspire new recruits and perhaps touching on that nostalgia nerve too. But more broadly, the Pentagon is seeking to widen the net for recruits, focusing less on traditional pools and seeking ex- to expand to new groups. So they're, they're appealing to the 80s when it was normal-ish. And they're also you know, bombing their own campaign by expanding it to other groups, which is probably part of the reason why it's not working to get white recruits. Yeah, but you need to market strategically to the exact kind of group that are most likely to sign up, which is patriotic American men. Like, all they need to do for their recruitment ad is capture the essence of American sniper. (laughs) It's not difficult. Like, the American public love that. It was one of the most successful Mm. R-rated movies of all time, despite being part of the Iraq war, which the American public were generally against, particularly as that was going on. And it's because it captured the hoorah spirit. I enjoyed the film. It's a great film. Yeah. Really sad. So capture that spirit rather than, I have two mums. Oh, piss off. So this has gone all the way up to the US Department of Defense, as you'd probably expect, and they gave some reasons for it. They said, um, the COVID-19 pandemic limited the ability of recruiters to interact with potential recruits, which seems fairly reasonable, um, at least in the past, but now we're out of that time. And I don't think that excuse necessarily sticks anymore. Well, it shouldn't have stuck at the time because, oh no, you're going to join the military and get shot at? Let's not have a face-to-face meeting. You might catch a cold. <laughs> yeah, <it's, laughs> when, you, when you put it like that, you know what, you're right. Painfully done. And um, they say the U- US economy is booming with low in- unemployment. I, I don't know what economy they're looking at. And the number of adult influencers with experience in the min- military continues to drop. There aren't enough influencers in the military. I, I never thought I could read something so stupid as that. It's like, yes, we, what we need is more people on TikTok with military backgrounds. That's what they have been doing. Didn't Callum do that thing, the segment a little while ago, where they were paying women in the military who were attractive to make TikToks try yes. and bait simps into fighting? Yep. That's what we need, the beta male legion. <laughs> but like YouTube will actively sort of suppress or, or, or throttle guys like that anyway. I follow a, a number of YouTubers that are ex-military people and yeah, obviously the powers that be at Alphabet don't want to promote these these voices because mm. you know they'll be sort of they will be based, um, you know, someone like Don the Pleb. Um, yeah, it's, they 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 try to actively suppress people like that, don't they? Yeah, Jocko Willink. Right, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So another thing they're trying to do is using data to uh, make the medical record checks more efficient, and they're just using a new system to do that, which I don't really see how that's going to get thousands of people in. Well, especially than... not if you increase the complications of medical records with your recruits by undoing mm-hmm. tram- uh, Trump's transgender troop ban. Yeah. Well, uh, we mentioned ads. Um, this is uh, a more recent one. This came out in November time. So, you know, it's over the past couple of months. And it was just a regular, you know, what you would expect of a military ad. And I think that that, that betrays their desperation that they've actually returned to what they think works. Well, Israel gets attacked. Go on, white boys, strap your helmets on. Mm-hmm. That's genuinely their, their approach to it. And uh, the, I would be remiss to not mention this one, which I actually covered at the time in 2022. Um, 
that Top Gun was actually a better recruitment ad than the lesbian wedding cartoon the army made, which uh, there's a screenshot of it. Don't worry, I'm not going to subject you to it. We've already played it once on the podcast and that's too much. That is sort of at a glance, kind of obviously, just so subversive. Oh, it's, it's, it's where it's absurd, been absurd. Yeah, it's when something's been absolutely turned inside out and upside down. Mm. I remember it was quite a few years ago. Now you probably remember this. There's in the UK there was an advert to to join the British Army where there's a patrol walking along. No, I have to stop. So the Muslim member. I've got of, that in. I'm going to show right, it. Yeah, he has to pray. It's time <laughs> praying. I remember I seeing believe that. Believe it. Yeah. And yet I couldn't believe what my eyes are seeing. Is this real? Can this really be real? Well, I watched a documentary on the paratroopers for a couple of years ago. You know, they're real tough lads, really respectable. And most of the time, the documentary focused on uh, one black recruit and one kid who had been brought over from Afghanistan to then join the paras. And I think he ended up failing out anyway. And it was like, do you want to focus on any of the other recruits at all? Or do we still have to insist on minoritarian concerns? Mm-hmm. So... It's not just the US, it's in the UK as well. And if anything, it might even be worse than the UK because the Navy has so few sailors, it has to decommission ships. And this is um, a tragedy in my mind because I've, I've seen many of these ships myself, you know, in the, the Plymouth Sound. It's um, a place where lots of the military warships go. So it's going to be a shame to stop seeing them. But the HMS Westminster, um, which was recently refurbished as well, very expensive on behalf of the taxpayer, and the HMS Argyle will be decommissioned. This is probably the only time they could actually do a woke recruitment ad, because if they wanted new seamen, they could just go down to Pride Parade. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. I'm here all week. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently there will be some new Type 26 frigates uh, on the way, um, but I haven't really seen much about them. I've only seen concept photos, and they look Similar to those, really. They're not too different. You need an eye for warships to really be able to tell the difference. But not only that, but the Royal Marines, one of our um, most elite forces, has a shortfall of 600 troops. And um, if I scroll down, it's worth mentioning here this graph, which kind of annoyed me because the, the axes don't go all the way to zero, so you can't see the vast sum of the recruitment. But we went from 7,200 down to 5,822, which seems too few anyway. 7,200 seems like too few Royal Marines to my mind. Aren't we at the lowest number of reservists since the Napoleonic Wars? We've got 750 reservists. There's not even 1,000 reservists in the Royal Marines in the UK, which, you know, you know the, the country that has ruled Britannia, Britannia rules the waves. Well, where's, where's our navy? It's, it's, it's shameful. <clears throat> I mean, you know, we haven't ruled the waves since the 30s. But nonetheless, yeah, the whole point of having a navy is to project your power abroad. Mm. Um, and not that I'm excusing it or anything, but we don't need, we don't do that anymore, really. Um, we leave it up to America, really, don't we? Well, but the, yeah. and they do have a massive navy. The U.S. Navy is a beer moth. Mm. It's absolutely gigantic. Dwarfs all other navies easily. Yeah, just looking at the sort of aircraft carrier metric. Right. It's not even close. We're, we're pretty close to the top by having one. Mm. There's only a f- like half a dozen countries or maybe a few more that have even got one aircraft carrier. Exactly. And America's got, I think, 20-odd, and there's 12 at sea at any given moment, something in that ballpark anyway. No, I don't think they're the mm. exact numbers, but something like that. So in other words, all the other world's navy- navies combined couldn't stand against the U.S. Navy. Um, but nonetheless, yeah, only having a few thousand Marines... It does seem too few, doesn't it? it it's a little bit worrying because I, I know uh, quite a few Marines myself because some of my uh, old school friends were in the Marines. And, you know, they're, they're, they're good people. They're, you can tell they're going to be good soldiers. So it's a shame that one of our more um, prestigious forces seems to be crumbling away. That, you know, that, we're shelving ships and losing recruits. That being said, the only concern is coming back to, okay, who gets to choose where said Marines would be deployed? Oh, right. It's Grant Shapps and Tobias Elwood and the like who say we need mm-hmm. troops on the ground in Ukraine and in Israel, basically to uphold the post-war liberal world order. That's why I'm, I'm conflicted about it, right? Because on the one hand, you know, if we had my utopia, we would have a strong military because that would be one of the few branches of government left. And we would be able, we would be able to defend ourselves quite comprehensively. 
But with this, we know that there are going to be potential foreign wars that are just money laundering schemes for weapons manufacturers. And so no one wants to die for profit margins, do they really? Couldn't have put it better myself. So moving on to here, um, this was this year as well. Female army recruits are the key to solving the armed forces recruitment crisis. It is worth mentioning as well that my sister has recently uh, joined the, the Royal Air Force for full transparency, although not in a combat role. So uh, you know, I'm not necessarily against them joining the military if it's not frontline troops, right? Agreed. You know, but this you're is, in like a command center or something like that, that's fine. Again, this is Grant Shapps, and I know someone who has worked very closely with Grant Shapps for many years, and he has said, my boss is an idiot. So Grant <laughs> Shapps doesn't have his own opinions. It's always fed to him by whatever consultant or... like He, would, he used to get ring my mate up in the middle of the night and go, I've just been on the phone to Bill Gates, and he's had this great idea. And I'm just like, thanks, Grant. So basically, Grant, Grant Shapps doesn't know what he's talking about, as per usual. I could have told you that. To but... say the British Army... Or our foreign policy in general, we don't do much which isn't hasn't been greenlit by the State Department and the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. So it's not that we we don't do anything without their say so, but we're we're close allies. Y yes, the special relationship just means that we're their dog's body. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, we do the dirty work. Yeah, am I going to fight and die for king and country, or is it for? The State Department, or is it for the Raytheon shareholders? Yeah, whoever right? Nancy I mean, Pelosi invested in yesterday. Yeah. So it gets worse than that. Um, the British RAF chief calls it unacceptable for China to recruit Western military pilots. So our pilots have been going over because the Chinese have been offering them better money and training Chinese pilots, which I think is treasonous. And that they shouldn't be doing it. They should have a moral conscience because they should know better than work for the Chinese, but also we shouldn't be in a position where we're letting our pilots go to China. But we also act post-nation state. In a globalized do, yeah. economy, why should you have any national loyalty? That's genuinely the question that we ask to our elites, because Rishi Sunak is the thumbnail of this article for all mm. your listeners. Could you think of a more like, regional manager of the globalist constituencies than this fella? It, you're hard pressed. Do you know he's in Ukraine today promising another how many billion? Because Grant oh, Shapps told me so because the military industrial complex told them so. A couple of things I'll say is that there's, um, you know, I've spoken to Tim Davies, who's an officer mm. in the RAF, and, um, you know, you, imagine you come out of the RAF, you're a pilot, say, and, uh, you know, you've got to make a new life for yourself. There's civil aviation, or, like, you know, China or um, the UAE, Dubai or someone, offers you loads of money to go and be in their air force and train their, their guys. You sort of can't blame them if your country's turned mm -hmm. its back on you a bit. Also, another quick thing to say is this isn't new no. um, outsourcing expertise. One thing that sprung to mind is um, after World War I or between the two world wars, Britain basically helped Japan become a first-rate naval power. We found ourselves at war with them in the, in the <laughs> 40s in, during World War II. Mm. So this isn't new. It's not like this is suddenly a thing. It's just but unwise. It's, it, mm. Yeah, 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 I, yeah I it's agree. unwise for sure. The 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 government shouldn't have allowed this situation to pass. But you know, I, you, there's some moral judgment can be passed on the people who choose to do it. I think is my sort of view on it. But I'm going to go through these links pretty quick fire because we've gone on for a little while now. So there, there is this as well. This was the ad. See if I can get a picture of it of mm -hmm. the, the, the the prayer. British man. Yeah. It's worth mentioning as well, the number of um, Muslim recruits in the British Army is in the double digits, if not less. It's a very, it's an even smaller minority than the Islamic one in the UK more generally, which isn't really surprising. Is also, it? look, um, again, I'm not speaking from a position of authority here because I'm in no way in the military. Isn't that a massive tactical liability to just be standing around on a hillside waiting for your guy to finish praying? Yes. It's absurd. It's one of those things when I first saw this, I was thinking, I want to know who are the consultancy companies that came up with this? Who are the people in the military or the Defence Department that greenlit it? Muslim what Council we, of Britain, probably. What is that? You know, and this is years old. This is quite a few years old. 2018. Right, okay. It's, it's disgusting. And just to, to show that it's not just the UK and the US, I've got Australia here as well. Um, this was May of last year, but they warned of a recruitment crisis as well. So it seems to be in all of the sort of former British Empire countries, sorry to refer to you in that way, United States. But What's the Anglosphere? I don't like the, the term Anglosphere because 
implies we're all Anglo, right? Well, we used to be. But uh, as well here, Australia may use defense exchanges with Pacific countries uh, to tackle their recruitment crisis. So oh, recruiting yeah, the- foreign people. And I mean, they, they, they're, they're most likely going to fight China and a lot of the Pacific countries won't like China. But even so, there are lots of questions of recruiting. It's like hiring mercenaries in a sense. Well, Trudeau was doing joint exercise with the Chinese military recently. Well, that's suicidal, yeah. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Like they were, they were actually scouting Canadian terrain. And could you imagine how furious some people in the US military would be that that makes a, an invasion from the north far more probable for them? It, it is a, a massive middle finger to south of the border from the Canadians in them doing that. Machiavelli talks about this, and it comes up in epochs surprisingly often. If only that he did what Machiavelli had said. Yeah, don't staff your armed forces with foreign people. <laughs> That's a recipe for disaster. It will mm-hmm. come back and, and bite you in the ass if you do that. It's well, terrible. To hit our quota, isn't that basically how the Roman Empire fell? They were outsourcing well, it to yeah. a lot of ethnic mercenaries, and they just went, well, why do we have to fight for Rome? Can't we just sack it? We'll fill our legions with Germans and Saxons and Gauls. And uh, oh, what a surprise. They've subverted the whole thing inside out and now we're powerless. It's a story as old as time, isn't it? So um, the final thing I wanted to mention, because you know, we might think, okay, this is a Western thing. Well, uh, it seems like there could potentially be a problem in China as well. And the, the reporting on this has been confusing because some outlets have been reporting that they're desperate to fill their ranks. Others have been saying that they're actually swelling their ranks and they're far exceeding the recruitment of the West. So th- this Newsweek one does give some sort of justification that seemed reasonable to me. China's struggling to attra- attract talent has attributed to two factors. China's generation-long family planning regime known as the one-child policy. Although now scrapped, it has left parents cautious about, cautious about sending their only child to the military where they could ex- potentially experience war. And according to a research report by Lauro Horta for Singapore's blah, 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 blah school. Um, I'm not going to read it. Um, and also, salaries were another factor. Benefits offered by the private sector in China were far more attractive than the incentives to serve the state. Which... This, is, this is why they banned girly man content on TikTok. Yes. They genuinely banned K-pop stars because they were saying that they're feminizing our men and we want them to join the military. Mm-hmm. In anticipation of something, I'm sure. So these reasons seem quite sound to my mind. That, you know, you've got one child, you don't want to send them off to war. That's, you know, parental love at play there. That makes sense why that would motivate people. And also, the private sector being more lucrative, you get better opportunities. That makes sense to me as well. It's not that, you know, oh, well, we're, we're trying to get women, but we can't. I mean, come on. But then uh, Washington Examiner also reported, this was in August, so around a similar time to this, this previous one, which I think was, when was it? Um, November. November. So it was um, shortly before. China boosts record high military recruitment. So, you know. Take it with a pinch of salt. Well, it could well sure be their, their targets to... changed in that time, or it could well be that they've got a massive population, so they've got far larger infantry than any of the West, but proportionate to their targets, it's fallen mm-hmm. short. Well, yeah. China was just lying. It's just propaganda. Yeah, I was going to say Heaven that... forbid the CCP might tell a porcupine. That's why no I included... No precedent for that. That's why I included both, because okay. you can't really trust any figures that come from China as a general rule. So it, it seems to me that nobody's joining the military. And on the, on the one hand, it's bad news for the military industrial complex, which have basically rigged our countries as some sort of battery farm for profit. And on the other, it does raise questions of national security if this continues to get worse. I think we're okay for the meantime, right? The US military is still massive. The UK still is able to defend itself. If this trend is allowed to continue and there's no intervention that's successful, it could get into the realm of causing serious problems for our national defense. And I, I know that Russia is not particularly going to be a problem for a lot of Western countries, considering how depleted their manpower pool is. Um, but the Chinese certainly seem to be recruiting a fair amount um, just based on their, their standing military alone. And so that's what we may need to be paying attention to, of course. There are questions about whether China is a paper tiger or not, but this has gone on long enough. So I think the the moral of the story is um, woke recruiting doesn't work. And believe it or not, that telling white people they're bad weakens your country. If you appreciated that episode from the podcast of the Lotus Eaters, you can go to lotuseaters.com, get access to all the premium content that's on the site. 
such as the Contemplation series, this episode on why you should read C.S. Lewis. If you'd like to find out what else is being put out, you can follow on Twitter at lotuseaters underscore com on Twitter. Thank you and goodbye.